Even though I'm sure most people who've watched The Wire feel like Season 4 is the best, I think there's a strong case to be made for the inherent superiority of Season 3. That being said, the whole show is absolute heat, so it doesn't really matter which season you prefer, but still, I like Season 3 the most. But in order to illustrate superiority, I would first need to go over each season and point out their many strengths and weaknesses. While the show doesn't necessarily have a bad season, it does have a clear hierarchy in quality, and that order is 3rd, then 4th, then 1st, then 5th, then 2nd. But before I continue, I need to stress that anybody who's watching this video should either A, have already seen the show, or B, not have any intention of watching the show in the future. Because like always, I'm going to be telling the whole plot of the series and analyzing what works in each season. So The Wire takes place in Baltimore, which is where all the excess niggas that would have otherwise been in the DMV are forced to reside. As such, it faces a long list of problems, from its trash ass underfunded police departments, to its shipping system, corrupted by organized crime, to its governing bodies, which are more interested in good press than in actual change, to its school system, that encourages students to be threats to society by its ineptness, and finally to its media, which chases whatever headline can bring the most money rather than shed a light on pressing issues. So you know, it's like every other inner city, but the show spends each season covering each part of what I just described. But the best part is, it's not some shitty anthology series, so it's not like we have to get used to a completely new cast each time the season changes. The most recurring characters in the story are the detectives who generally want to bring down crime. But don't worry, my Negro brethren, because this show is not just some giant's 12 nut hugging fest, because it actually shows why the police are often useless and how they do things that foster mistrust in the communities that they were supposed to serve. But also, Fred not to the law and order community out there, because the show makes it clear that the top gang leaders in the streets are scum who don't actually care about their neighbors either. So it's not like you're made to feel that sorry for them. The first season starts out with a detective being told that a nigga got packed up for running off with the funds, even though the block lets him do so every other time. The detective's name is McNulty, and unlike many of his co-workers, he actually has a hate boner for the guys running the streets like that, and that guy's name is D'Angelo Barksdale, who's also the nephew of the nigga who runs the gang, named Avon Barksdale. And these guys want to be the mafia so bad, so it's called the Barksdale Organization, like it's a family business or something. Anyway, they've been responsible for dozens of packs throughout the years, so McNulty takes it upon himself to snake his boss Rawls and talk to the judge about the growing crime problem. So the judge gets in the cops ass over it, particularly the police commissioner named Burrell, created a whole task force led by the lieutenant named Daniels that used to be corrupt maybe. Also, McNulty is going through a divorce because he couldn't keep his dick in his pants, but of all people to pipe, he picked the district attorney. But yeah, under Daniels is a cop named Kima, a bunch of randos, a guy named Carve, a trier named Herc, and a shapeshifter named Sidner. Because they get nothing accomplished, MVP Lester Freeman, aka that real nigga from John Wick, joins the case, along with the loser named Press Belusky, so they can decode message on the wire that the judge let them use on the Barksdale gang. Presbyluski only has the job because his father-in-law Valchek actually has clutch in the PD, but he's so off one and he ends up taking some kid's eye outs, which is why he's in the back with Lester instead of in the field. Back at McNulty's main workplace, there's his best friend Bunk and some guy who I guess is their boss, but not as high up as Rawls named Jay, and they don't really do anything to bring the plot forward in this season, so we'll let them be for now. When it comes to the street shit, Barksdale's right-hand man and McNulty's main arch enemy is Stringer Bell, who's like in charge of keeping all the niggas in line. There's also Weebay, who rolls blunts for with all packs, and a bunch of other hitters that don't really matter. Following his unnecessary t-shirt printing, D'Angelo decides to send him an apartment complex, where he's responsible for overseeing the drug dealing adventures of three young men named Bodie, Poots, and Wallace, cause they're like the guys in charge of all the low-level runners and stuff, but all they really do is sit around on the couch all day and get periodically hooded by 12. In addition to the wiretap given by the judge, the cops, in particular Kima and sometimes McNulty, get their information from a snitch named Bubs, but snitch is a mean word for such a character, so let's call him an informant instead. And unfortunately, despite being a real nigga for the most part, he and his irrelevant psychic or addicts. One day, the stash house for the white is moved, and local W. Omar sees it, so he fucks over the Barksdales and robs them, with like a small crew of his boyfriend and some rando. But the Barksdales can't take such disrespect without retaliation, so they kidnap, torture, and murk the boyfriend, and leave the pack in public for Omar to see, leading him to declare war on the Barksdales, which is justifiable, but still kind of a problem for 12, because they need the niggas alive so he can give them cases. After convincing Omar to snitch on one of the shooters, they try to get him to chill out and all that catching body stain, but he isn't going, until he catches Avon slipping one day and makes his move. Hey! They had cheese fries, baby! I got you some! Now, I already liked the show beforehand, but this scene alone made me completely invested in the show, like it's one of the hardest scenes in the entire series. 
but yeah, Omar misses and gets a couple shots, so he decides to lay low for a while. On the attempted mission, Avon was at a nightclub that was owned by some guy called Orlando, but it looks like most of the gang just treats him like a scrub, so he tries to make a name for himself by going to get another dealer for the whites. He tries to get D'Angelo in on it, but being a loyal nephew, he goes and tells on him, and he gets the bricks beaten off of him. I'm deterred by the fact that this all probably isn't worth it. Orlando continues his attempts to buy the white from a non-local source, but said source turns out to be the shapeshifter so Orlando is forced to cooperate to avoid catching the real case. So Kima goes under covers to get something from one of Avon's shooters, but they know he's been telling and light the whip up, turning him into a pack and putting Kima on a stretcher. So 12 decides to come hard, cause you know, a cop's life is worth infinitely more than some peasant civilians, and Shrinker gets way better to get the cop shooter missing, so 12 can get off their ass. Also back to the boyfriend pack, Wallace got all traumatized by seeing that, even though he's supposedly from the streets, and he somehow ends up working with 12, who relocate him to his grandma's crib. After a cool minute, he decides that all that civilian shit is lame, so he tries to go back to his old block, but what he doesn't realize is once you leave the game, you can't come back which is kind of a problem, because now the gang knows that someone is giving out their trade secrets because of the wire. So Stringer has Bodie and Poots, put Wallace on his shirts, but D'Angelo isn't really feeling all that, so he doesn't know if he wants to associate with such men anymore, but then he gets caught up with like a warehouse full of the whites, so Twelve tries to get him to turn on his niggas, but with all the nonsense everyone has put him through, he's about to turn a new leaf, but then his mom shows up, because it turns out the box organization really is a family business, and she tells him that people you share ancestors with matter above all other things, and that if he rats, it's gonna be up for them, so he changes his mind and takes a massive charge, while the negro behind all of this just goes a couple of years, because as far as the law is concerned, this is the first major offense, so you know, happy ending, but not happy, because it turns out Rawls is still in his feelings over the whole judge thing, so McNulty gets assigned to do boat stuff, which is like the lamest thing possible. In the next season, they felt the need to change the intro, and I have to say, I was not happy with the decision. I was also not happy with the decision to give some dock workers a whole episode and season out of nowhere, but don't worry, in time I came to accept and even like both changes. While this season is still the one I care about the least, it is in no way a bad season. In fact, it's still better than 90% of the TV shows that exist out there. It may have actually been received better if it wasn't wedged between two absolute seasons of heats before and after. That being said, it's the most disconnected of all the seasons to the themes and characters of the general plots, so I'm not really going to touch on it as much as the others. There's this union leader at the docks named Frank Sabaka that has a beat with Valchek over the Catholic Church in Poland or something. Because niggas not checking for blue collars anymore, many of the docks have seen their hours decreased over time, so Frank has resorted to helping the Byzantine Mafia use their ships to transport stuff. After McNulty finds a lone pack in the water, a whole truckload of them is found in the docks, linking the two together. So 12 comes down on their asses for it, and puts them on a wire, because Valchuk wants them gone. At first it's Press Belusky and a bunch of randos, but then Press hasn't changed, mostly the guys from the first season. While Frank was to stop working for the Mafia, money is money, and also his nephew Nick and loser son Ziggy are broke too, and need the funds, which gets them roped in. While Nick is somewhat competent while making deals, Ziggy is a tryhard that nobody takes seriously, leading him to owe money to another tryhard named Cheese, who's the nephew of a real ass nigga named Proposition Joe, who was like Ava's main rival. But now that Ava's in a cell, everyone from all over the city is getting their stuff together as part of a co-op, because Prop Joe's the only one with the good connects, as from the Byzantines. While Stringer wants to join the co-op, Avon tries to stop it from jail, because he doesn't want to rely on any other Negroes. Also, he orchestrates some scheme where a CEO gets caught with the whites, so Avon can tell on him and get a reduced sentence, which works because you know Avon runs the place. But while this is going on, the Angel is not feeling his uncle over the whole, taking two decades for a case stain, and starts to distance himself from the gang. Stringer notices this and starts piping the mother of his child like any other stand-up man would do. So to get rid of two problems at once, he has one of his young boys put him on his shirts, while making it seem like he put himself on his shirts. And because Stringer is an extra unclean spirit, he goes on to console the family about it to their faces, knowing exactly what he's done. Also, when Avon hires a nation of Islam guy named Brother Muzon to get rid of the competition, Stringer has to take care of that too. So he tells Omar that it was Muzon who did his husband like that. So when Omar gets the drop of Muzon, he prepares to light up a new pack, but when Muzon reveals he didn't do it, Omar can tell an honest man when he sees one and lets him go. When Ziggy tries to make some money with the Byzantines, he ends up getting scammed on account of being a dweeb, so he ups a pull on him and gets arrested, where he ends up cracking because he's not about that. When Frank finds out what happens to his son, he considers telling on the Byzantines so he can have a safer release, but when the Mafia CFO, aka Chris's teacher, tells Nikki that the Byzantines can get their case dropped if they don't cooperate, he tells Frank about it, so he goes to meet with them, but sadly, some snake ass ho ass nigga watching the FBI, unless the Byzantines know that Frank was even talking to 12, and even though he didn't even give them any major information and changed his mind, it was too late, so the realest one in the season had to go out sad. When Nikki sees the pack, he agrees to cooperate, and they get some of the Byzantines gone, but unfortunately, the CEO and CFO manage to escape, and they're not even Greek or something. While most of the season is largely irrelevant to the rest of the show, what matters specifically is the nonsense Stringer was doing in his plots, and the fact that the Mafia still has the connection to the streets. By the third season, the towers from the first season have been demolished, so now broke boys have to move around. Also, the old wiretap unit is still in effect, but now they're after a guy called Marlo, who came out of the old Broxdale crew spot. 
Not only is Marla a problem for Bruxy on 12, but he's also causing problems for the whole co-op by refusing to join it. At first, Stringer tries to get him to join, but he isn't going. While Avon is more interested, been putting some holes in Marlo. Thanks to this scheme from the last season, Avon is out of jail. But before that, one of his hitters named Cuddy was released after breaking someone decades ago. And when he gets out, he's given a pack to sell, which ends up getting finessed by one of Marlo's guys, so he just has to take it. Then he visits his ex, who's now a professional, which inspires him to leave the street life and actually be a productive member of society. He starts landscaping, then gets the idea to form a boxing gym for niggas in the neighborhood, and he gets the money from Avon, who had been released some episodes earlier. You see, after Avon was released, he had to kind of rebuild the gang, seeing as most of them were taken out of the way. But while Avon is this battle hardened tough guy, the writers attempt to rewrite history by making it seem like Stringer wasn't really about that action back when they were growing up or something. I mean, Stringer was always more logical of the two, sure, but he was still down to catch some bodies when need be. But anyway, now Stringer is some nerd taking community college classes, as McNulty finds out through stalking him. You see, after getting blue balled by the way the Greeks evaded justice in the last season, McNulty has turned all his attention towards Stringer, because he sees him as the one loose end from season 1. This is kind of a problem though, because the major crimes unit he's a part of is specifically tasked with getting Marlo up out of the way. To circumvent this, McNulty starts going by Daniel's back and forcing him to refocus on Stringer, but don't worry, Daniel gets his get back when he starts piping the DA. Speaking of marriage problems, Hima's also going through with her wife, because she's mad about a kid or something. Whatever, it's irrelevant. But in more important news, Bubbles is trying to turn his life around, and that kind of requires leaving his drug buddy behind to get wasted in the drug free zone, which is a perfect way for me to transition to the Hamsterdam plots. Because as I was writing the script for this video, I really wasn't sure how I was gonna do that. You see, some real nigga named Colvin got tired of seeing all the cops do basically nothing and chase addicts while packs were being collected. So he came up with a brilliant idea to move with the low level bump dealers and addicts to a section of town that was abandoned anyway, except for one old hoe that refused to see the writing on the wall. But anyway, here, they will be free to conduct their drug sales without intrusion by the cops, so they can instead focus on the whole gun violence thing. Of course, being the genius plan that it is, the higher staff of the police and government couldn't know about it, because back in the 2000s, niggas weren't on that wavelength yet. I don't care what you niggas say, but this plotline was amazing. To see the police be forced to actually work with dealers they hated over a sense of obligation was really interesting. I know Colvin told them that it was all a trap to get them to be in one place before they get taken out, but I don't even know if that was true. By all indications, I feel like Colvin intended to just keep it like that indefinitely, so real time will get the attention it needs to be addressed. That's also not to say that there isn't a clear problem with drug addicts not giving the help they need while those feeding their addiction are giving a hard time to thrive. But if we're looking at the entire situation, I think it's a lesser evil compared to the same issue existing except with innocent people getting lit up in the crossfire. But all good things must come to an end because eventually, a journalist catches wind of the plot and is exposed to a man named Karketi who wants to make Baltimore a better place. At the beginning of the season, Karketi was introduced as a councilman who wants it better for the city. But upon making connection with the police department, he begins setting his eye on being mayor, which is kind of snaky. And Considering he knows that's what his friend was after too, but whatever. I know I've been all over the place and left a lot of stuff out, but the show is split in a way where each episode has like four plot lines, you know, because it's HBO, so it gets kind of complicated. But to wrap it all up, the box is having inner conflicts. There's been tension between the two. I saw him move forward with the organization, which Shinger wants to legitimize the business through real estate, while Avon wants to continue how it's always been, while not really trying to worry about the co-op. This, along with the fact that Avon has been disagreeing with him on how to handle Marlo, who he's been at war with the entire time, leads to a fight. What Stringer tells him that he was in deep the angel being set to the next dimension. Despite learning that Stringer murked his nephew, Avon chooses to let it slide, or so we think. After Stringer gets scammed by Clay Davis, a senator who was caught with drug money in season 1, who's also known for playing Ed and Eddie games on niggas, he wants revenge, but Avon at least has the sense to know that government niggas are off limits. I think Slim gonna have to sit this one out, boss. Another thing the gang has to deal with is Omar is back robbing stash houses and only drug dealers, but after a shootout with his new crew produces one pack, he starts to chill out, and he even helps Bunk get a cop's gun back. Then his grandma gets blasted at under Stringer's orders on a Sunday, and and everyone has problems with that, even Avon, because you just don't do that. Even though you do kill innocent civilians, who just happens to be witnesses, but whatever. I guess Avon's gone soft, but Omar's being chased by Brother Muzon, who still bounced out of shape over the whole attempted murder by Stringer thing. So after torturing Omar's boy, he tells Omar that he knows where Stringer is. It turns out Avon gave him the location. One, because he didn't want those problems with Muzon, and two, because I think he really isn't cool with how Stringer's been acting up. But if you think that's snaking, actually, Stringer went to Colvin with information on Avon, which he then passed to McNulty, because not only could Stringer no longer trust Avon, but he felt like his world with Marlo would bring unnecessary hits to the empire they were building. So in the end, both men ended up snaking each other, with Stringer not blunt and being false claimed by Marlo's guys, while Avon gets caught up, which is a shame too, because the 12 had just waited a little longer, Avon would have finally gone that fuckboy Marlo up out of the way. I mean, seeing as he got the drop on him. In other news, the Amsterdam plot has been exposed, and Colvin is kicked from his job without benefits. While the police are forced to dismantle what progress they've made, also McNulty, seeing that the detective work has consumed his life, decides to take a step back and just be a regular cop. Now season 4 is almost as here as season 3, like I said before, I can respect the idea that it's the best season, I just prefer 3, and it's mostly a matter of personal taste. But anyway, for this season, the plot shifts to school, where four boys named Naaman, Randy, 
Duke, and Michael are entering 8th grade, while dealing with all the nuts that comes with being in the hood. To start with, two of Marlo's niggas are now shown in more prominence, with one of them named Snoop, starting this season by purchasing a tool, but not that kind, the real kind. It turns out she's trying to use it to get a niggas missing, cause she and Chris, who's like Marlo's second in command, have been putting niggas in boarded up houses. Anyway, the four main boys are first really shown, bullying, then defending Dukakis from bullies from other blocks, and while most of them are real, it looks like Naaman, the rich one, is actually kind of fake, and not only is he the most annoying one of the four, but he's also Weebae's son, which entitles him to a role in what remains of the Bruxel organization, which you get from Bodhi, who's like the last nigga standing, along with Slim Charles. When they get to school, they see Prasbaluski as their new teacher. Back in season 3, he did this thing where he shot another cop, cause he was off duty or something, and it was an L, but he finally realized that the viewers had it for years, and that he was not fit to be a cop, so he decides to be a teacher, and at first, he finds it difficult to relate to the unruly negroes at hand, but after the class gets segregated, with cause like Naaman and the other tribes given their own class, Prasbo can finally work in peace, and that's subplot. Sengbae wants to study how hood children operate, so he gets Coven to assist him in overseeing a class with the most worthless students. Over time though, Naaman grows from being a thoughtless weirdo to an actual person with goals. As a result of his exposure to the outside world, too bad his bum mother still wants him to be in the streets. Oh wait, we may fix that. Never mind. Now Naaman can go to school. Speaking of education, now that his psychic is gone, Bobbles has resumed his business of selling stuff, but this time with a kid he met at the drug zone named Sherrod. But because of the inner city experience, Sherrod has been denied a basic education, which kind of messes up with Bobbles' business, so he sends him to school so he can learn, which is kind of too tough for him. Also, they both get bullied by another addict, who needs to catch some shells. One time, Bobbles tries to get some help, but it just so happens to be from one of the most L cops in the series, who then proceeds to rob him too, proving once again that some people should be deleted. In the police department, Daniels was shuffled out of major crimes, who didn't know what he was doing in the war on Marlo, so came and Lesser become detectives instead, leaving Herc to carry on in the war. He ends up losing a camera to Marlo, so he becomes personal. Then Randy, one of the boys from earlier, ends up getting his life in jeopardy, because the lame-ass principal threatens to remove him from his foster mom, all because he won't snitch on the guys. I mean, they were accused of the R word, but still. Then he offers to give up information on a body that one of Marlo's guys caught, because throughout the season, he had been haunted by it. Speaking of Marlo, it appears that he's also not beefing with Omar, because you know, you robbed him and all. So he asked Chris to put some random woman on a shirt, and make the store owner say it was Omar that did it, which ended with him getting put in a Cell, but seeing as he's like the Rorschach of the show, he can't stay there for too long. So Bunk helps him prove his innocence, and when he gets out, he makes Proctor tell him when the next shipment is coming, so he can finesse every drug dealer in the city all at once. The definition of a W character. Meanwhile, Brocchetti runs for mayor, and actually ends up winning, because despite not being a negro, it's one of the times people really don't care, as long as it's not the useless mayor they already have. As mayor, Brocchetti tries to improve the whole murder problem by giving Daniels more to do, but he has to deal with the fact that he has more than one issue to deal with, and the schools matter more to people that are gonna vote for him. It also turns out that to get the money, he would have to meet right the Republican government to get it, and that's not an L he's willing to take, so I guess it's up for that. Also, Michael's mom is an addict, and his little brother's dad moved in after jail, but it turns out said dad is a you know who that did you know what with you know who, so you know who has asked Chris to get him missing. And I guess Chris also has a history with those things because he does what needs to be done and gets him gone in a particularly brutal manner. But after a season of denying Marlo's handouts, now Michael has found his soul souls to him as a result of this one favor, so he's working for the gang now. With Bubbles still getting harassed by the bully, he doesn't get hooked to help. But being the useless moron he is, he fails. So Bubs has him stop a priest and get his cop license revoked. He also has to watch after Randy when he came out to tell, but he couldn't do that either. But to be fair, it's also kind of this guy's fault too, for not giving the info to Bunk when Cop told him to. But anyway, the guy that told Randy to escort the future pack finds out that Randy told, but because he didn't escort the pack himself, Marlo has him packed up and labels Randy as a snitch, which ends with his foster mom getting her house blown up and him having to go back to the system. Upon seeing his friend on his shirt, Bodhi had enough of Marlo and goes to McNulty with the intention of telling, even the knows he's now reformed and chilling with that woman I didn't mention that helped him out in season 2 in the docks. But Buddy got caught talking, so Marlon and his niggas getting missing the next day, which I was not happy to see at all. As a result, McNulty is back in no life mode, knowing that his new mission is to catch Marlo. After Sherrod overdoes some poison left by Bubbles for the bully, he tries to put himself in a shirt, but doesn't succeed in doing so. The next season is cool and all, but a lot of people think the show fell off at this point. Personally, I like him with the season 2, but just like that one, it's not really relevant to the point of this video, so I'm going to sum up the point less time than the others. So with the firm hate bonus for Marlo established, McNulty devotes his life to making sure he gets caught by 12, but sadly for him, the police had their funds cut by the mayor in order to deal with the schools, so now the cops have to deal with being down terrible. To get the funds needed for the quest, McNulty begins to post packs as if a serial killer did them, but Bunk wants no parts of that. The news of a serial killer gets the press to have 
have a hard on because you know the industry is going outside. So one reporter feels that he needs to make stuff up to get even more attention for himself. Then he gets Lester on board so he can get a wire up for the serial killer while hacking it. So it's used for Marlo instead. Speaking of Marlo, now he's beef with Omar full time, and he's even got one of his associates put in a blunt. Marlo also snakes to Pop Joe with his own nephew Cheese. I managed to get the connects from the Byzantines with the help of Avon because West Side Master Race and gets Joe put in a blunt. Omar has not taken the world lying down though, and he comes back and almost gets murked one time. All while calling Marlo a hoe. Omar ends up getting murked by some lame ass hoe ass worthless piece of shit kid who, fun fact, was actually pretending to be him earlier. But while Marlo is not harassing his ops, he's using shows like Michael as shooters because now he has his own place with his brother in Dukakis. But eventually, Kima finds out about the serial killer scheme and snitches on McNulty to Daniels, who then tells the DA. And now the mayor looks bad because he made a big deal out of this. So McNulty and Lester are about to be out of a job, but they did manage to get Marlo and Chris in a cell. And because the wire was a secret, they were told it was a snitch who told, which leads Michael to be in danger. So he ends up murking Snoop, and she goes out begging to know how her hair was like, like it was worse pathetic. Better. But now Michael has to leave the gang and become the new Omar, while Zukakis becomes the new Bubs. But the original Bubs is doing better now he's off the whites, so I guess there is some good news. Because her can never be on the right side of history, he ends up working for the lawyer of literally every gang member in the series, and he finds out that there wasn't a snitch, which leads the lawyer to bug with the DA for reduced terms for Marlo. And he's back on the streets just like that, but it seems like the streets have the attention span of a drug addicted possum because nobody seems to care about him anymore. Also, Slim Charles gets his get back for Prop Joe by murking cheese. The series ends with Madalty having a fake funeral at the bar while he and Lester chill out, and so they have no hard feelings towards Kima, Bunk, or anyone else there. And McNulty sees as the city remains the same. Now that we've covered the seasons, it's time for the comparisons, most specifically between three and four. But before we get into that, let's talk about the intros. Now, the first one's my favorite, like it has that cool tone that sets the series, and it's a beautiful choice for the ending montage song, too. At first, I was only feeling the second intro, even though it's the original version of the song. But now it's grown on me, but I still put the third and fourth intros above it in that order. And last, we have the season 5 intro, which, while cool, wasn't quite as much of a W as the other ones. The coolest part of the intro is the inclusion of certain scenes and what they mean for the season and series at large. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, time to actually talk about what season 3 does best. I think what puts it above the rest to me are the characters. With this season, all the classics from season 1 are back, but we're introducing like interesting and likable stories of Cuddy and Colvin, adding the cool new character of Slim Charles, along with Prop Joe, expanding from his intrigued roles in season 2, the politics sub plots, while not the most interesting part of the series, is still engaging enough to keep me interested while also not feeling as out of place as the dogs had a season earlier. I get that season 4 is in everyone's hearts for the four boys, and they're like cool and all, but you can only tug my sympathy strings so hard until I tell you to get off your ass. Michael and Dukakis are cool, but Randy is mostly a perpetual victim. It's sad to see what he goes through, he's just constantly getting hoed, and Naaman is just annoying. I'm glad he found a way out of the upside down, but he and all the other guys in the class cross the nexus of feeling sorry for them and wanting them to get jumped. I like McNulty, but I don't necessarily think he's the most interesting character. He is interesting, don't get me wrong, but characters like Omar are a little more mandatory, so I wasn't too upset to see him take a backseat in season 4. I was however very upset to see Buddy gets into the sky over his attempt to snitch, as if a hard ass nigga like him would ever rot like that just cause Marlo made him forget what time it was. Still, that t-shirt pretty was as horrible as what happened to Omar, one of the most disrespectful scenes in history, but the main part I prefer the third season is the villains. While Marlo is also in season 3, at that point, he's more of a problem just for Avon and Stringer, the true main antagonist of the series. Like the thumbnail indicates, I think Avon performs the role much better than Marlo. To start with, Avon is far more entertaining to watch. He's charismatic, funny, and genuinely cares about his family. But at the same time, he's actually wicked. Like he has no qualms with clean civilians, just for witnessing, or even his own men, if they bring too much heat to his organization. It feels like Marlo's demeanor in later seasons is used to serve as a contract. Oh, look at Big Bad Marlo. It's like he has no soul. But the truth is, Avon could be just as devious as him, just with more of a personality. And if that wasn't enough, he has Stringer with him to provide another side of the game's complicated nature. Stringer was also not above killing innocents, but the difference is, he was far more reluctant to kill anyone than either Avon or Marlo, and when he did kill, he went to his accounts. The show does a masterful job of trying to fool you, and so I think he's the more well-rounded or reasonable of the two, well with his legitimate business attempts. But the truth is, he was in no way above harming the general population in pursuit of the funds. On one hand, you're just waiting to see when he'll get put on the pavement for all that he's done. But on the other, you can't help but admire his foresight to transition to a legitimate business, and you kinda wanna see how far he takes it. Marlo, on the other hand, has very little going for him. He lacks either the leadership characteristics of Avon or the book smarts of Stringer. Like, he's just some guy on the streets. And it's not even like he's Hannibal Lecter psycho or anything. Like, he's just some street nigga that barely emotes. When he does his dirt, I don't feel any sympathy or interest. I just want him gone. I mean, I do feel hatred, which I guess, you know, mission accomplished. But still, in his day-to-day -day life, when we actually see him on screen, he doesn't even do anything anyway. All he really does is chill out and talk to his guys about what they're going to do. Chris and Snoop carry his character, and that's mostly Chris. He seems to have some moral compass, although a very weak one, given he does this. 
Like, he tries to defend Michael as much as he can, maybe because he sees a younger version of himself in him, but beyond that, he's not really cutting it either. He loses some bump from the streets, not that taking a command of an organization that no doubt brings a lot of money on a constant basis. As a result, his presence does inspire the fear that an enforcer like Weebase would, while also not bringing a sense of calculated intelligence that Stringer does. I get that the new crew cannot be copies of the old one, but they could have at least made them interesting by their own merits. The new crew isn't completely ass. Like, I think it was interesting to see how long Chris's new get away with murking people and generally making the world a worse place. And there's something interesting in seeing their borderline psychopathic attitude towards taking lives, at least more than Marlo, but I feel like they serve their purpose better as rival gang members. Marlo's first actual show of emotion is when he finds out Armor talking heavy about him and he couldn't do anything about it because he didn't know, but even that wasn't enough to save his character. In the end, he just doesn't fit the final boss role as well as Avon did, and it causes me to look at season 3 more fondly as a result. Like I said earlier, this is all a personal preference. While I prefer the plots and especially characters of season 3, I can completely see why season 4 is more widely regarded. I mean, it does more to try to take out your hearts. It just didn't work on me enough to outweigh the absolute heat that I was watching Avon and Stringer have to deal with McNulty, Marlo, and each other all at the same time. I can acknowledge that the politics subplot was handled much better in Season 4, where it was actually working the other plots in a meaningful way, but still, I'd say Season 3 is the more enjoyable watch for me, with Season 4 a close second. I really like Season 1 as well, for setting the groundwork for all of this, while still being strong enough to stand on its own. Just remember that Avon is a boss, even while he's locked up, while Marlo is bombing, but after getting freed. So who do you really think is about it now?